So again, greetings everyone. Welcome to the first in the legal possibilities for software preservation mini series. Uh, my name is Jessica Meyerson, and on behalf of the Digital Preservation Coalition and the Software Preservation Network, we welcome you. Um, so just to provide some context for this episode, the Software Preservation Network's uh, Institute for Museum and Library Services Project Summary cites a 2014 to 15 survey of archives professionals in which 51% of survey participants identified access to licenses or sort of copyright challenges as an obstacle for emulated access to born digital materials. That survey response pattern indicates that even where there were staff resources available and technical constraints were not considered the most significant barrier, organizations are still hesitant to endorse software curation, preservation, sharing, and reuse unless they have some way to reconcile what they perceive to be the major legal challenges. And then in terms of why that matters, um, the inhibition of, or the, the, the sort of challenge that they're facing in terms of perceived risk assessment um, means that that sort of puts a stop on systematic software collection program development. Um, and most institutions don't currently know how they would access the software titles required to provide any sort of um, re-rendering, reproducibility, or emulated access. Um, and in terms of systematic software collection, no single institution can possibly collect all of the software titles or libraries needed to render and access the data in its collections present and future. So today, our special guests will help us to explore the current legal landscape surrounding software with an eye towards ongoing software preservation activities and their legal implications. And with that, I'd like to first start by uh, introducing Kendra Albert. Kendra is a technology lawyer and clinical instructional fellow at the Cyber Law Clinic at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard Law School. Their work has been published in The Green Bag, the Harvard Law Review Forum, and Wired. Kendra's undergraduate degree is from Carnegie Mellon University, where they studied lighting design and history. And before starting law school, Kendra worked as a research associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, where they founded Perma.cc. They also served as the first head teaching fellow for Copyright X, um, a, one of Harvard, uh, Harvard's professors, Professor William Fisher's open online copyright course. During law school, Kendra spent time at the uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation, Cloudflare, and Public Citizen. And with EFF, they co-filed and received a DCMA 1201 exemption request for video game archiving and play. We're also introducing Andrew Charlesworth, who is currently reader in IT and law and director of the Center for IT and Law at the University of Bristol. He's jointly appointed in the law school and the computer science department. And previously, Andrew founded the Information Law and Technology Unit at the University of Hull to promote teaching and research into the interaction of law and information technology. Andrew has published extensively and provided consultancy services in a wide range of related fields, including data, data privacy, research ethics, and intellectual property. He's currently co-editor of the Common Law World Review and serves on the editorial board of the International Journal of Digi Digital Curation. And last but certainly not least, we have Brandon Butler, who is the Director of Information Policy at the University of Virginia, where he focuses on intellectual property, copyright, licensing, and user privacy as they're related to the acquisition dissemination and preservation of information and cultural artifacts. He serves as an expert consultant to UVA librarians and to national and international efforts focused on relevant questions. Currently, Brandon is a co-PI on an Alfred P. Sloan Foundation funded project to articulate a best practices code for fair use in software preservation. Brandon was previously faculty at the American University Washington College of Law, where he instructed student practitioners at the Glushko Samuelson Intellectual Property Law Clinic. Brandon is also a steering member of the Software Preservation Network. So with that, we will dive into our discussion roundtable. And I'm kicking it off here, and then I'm going to hand it off to Paula. But this question is for all three of our speakers. Um, what are your methods, what are your resources, just for understanding um, the current legal and policy landscape specific to the sharing and reuse of software or software curation. 
So I can take a first stab at that one. Um, the, the methods and resources that I sort of bring to bear to this problem uh, are the, the methods and resources associated with um, leveraging library collections against a legal background generally. That is, I, I come to the software world uh, from the library world, and so, and, and, the, and, and in particular from library fair use world. And so my background and the tools that I'm familiar with and comfortable using, as, as, you'll, as you'll hopefully find later on, um, uh, are primarily uh, the limitations and exceptions to the copyright law that favor teaching and research, and in particular, fair use. And so um, I've been working with those tools for a little more than a decade, um, and I've only been working uh, with the wonderful world of software for uh, a little more than two years now. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm new to software, um, but those um, prior commitments to fair use and limitations and exceptions are what uh, really frame up these, uh, my encounter with software for me. That's great. Thank you, Brandon. Andrew, Kendra, would you like to, to follow from that? Sure, I can go next. Um, so uh, like Brandon, I'm sort of a, maybe a little bit of a transplant to the world of software preservation um, in that, so I'm a practicing attorney and what my primary sort of my primary methodology is like that of a practicing attorney, which is like reading case law, assessing risk, talking about the, the sort of very specifics of what a client's needs are. Um, but I sort of came into the software preservation space to some extent through working with computer security researchers and computer security law. Um, and so especially DMCA 1201, which we'll talk about a fair bit later, um, which is like my primary practice area in this space, um, is a, a sort of area of concern for a whole bunch of different fields, not just software preservation. Um, so I sort of came into it through that. Although, you know, when you look at my career, I've been actually sort of ended up doing a lot of preservation work, including perma.cc, which uh, just mentioned, and also working on copyright X and stuff like that. Um, so, but my focus tends to be on like helping clients solve like sort of a pretty practical legal problems in terms of here's what's in front of me, here's what I want to do, what are my risks, what 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 ways forward look better, what ways forward might be harder. That's great, Kendra. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, how take it away? <laughs> Thank you. Well, I mean, my my introduction to this came, I suppose, really through sort of troubleshooting. I used to do quite a lot of. Um, copyright and intellectual property related works with higher education institutions in the UK. And a lot of this kind of work used to come at me where there'd be a project in a higher education institution and they would say, we're having difficulty with copyright or we're having difficulty with patent or what have you, uh, help. And you would be sort of dropped into a project from, from great height at times. Uh, and you sort of had to pick apart what was what was going on. I mean, one of one of the projects I was involved in fairly early on was um, a project looking at what was then the BBC Doomsday Project. It was a an early digitization or an early digital project um, dealing with the collection of all kinds of different types of digital work to be included in a um, twin laser disc set of all things to be distributed um, to schools and universities. And this was run through the BBC. Um, the problem was that it appeared that at the time the project was run, nobody had done any background work on the intellectual property rights on any of it. Um, and so the, the, the question was, could we do anything with this resource? We had the laser disc, we located two of the, the machines that this used to be played on, which were Apple Acorn computers and uh, attached to laser discs. Um, but could you, could you rip the stuff from the laser disc? Could you reuse the imagery, the writing? Could you reuse the software? Could you emulate the software? And these were all questions that sort of came out of that, uh, of that project at which time there were really no answers. Um, so we were, we were sort of thrown back on sort of first principles. It's, does the law say anything about this? Does the law say we can do this? Does the law say we can't do this? Um, where do we go from here? And we eventually worked out a sort of a fudge 
for it based on the archive and library exemptions in the UK. Um, the project was then later on taken up by the BBC, and I know that one of the two laser discs is now online. It's actually available to be seen. Um, the other one is still offline, as far as I know, for technical reasons, which I suspect actually means we couldn't clear the copyright. Well, thank you, Andrew. Um, moving on, can you provide attendees with a brief overview of copyright and software, software curation in the US and the UK? And let's start with Kendra and then go on to Brandon and Andrew. Thank you. Um, sure. So I always, I laughed a little bit at this question because, you know, providing brief overviews of very complicated topics is both my job and something that I think every lawyer struggles with a little bit. Um, but so th the basic thing to understand about copyright, and I'm going to speak mostly to the U.S. context because that's what I, where I work, but Andrew is going to tackle the U.K. sort of a little bit later, is to understand that, um, so software is protected by copyright. There's different parts of software that we think of, you can think of a little bit differently, including, um, so, you know, at its base level, copyright treats software as a literary work in terms of the way it's like literal, the code is thought of as the kind of work, uh, work of literature, which is sort of a weird fit. And I know Brandon's going to talk about that in a second. But certain other forms of, certain forms of software have additional copyrighted work, like copyrighted parts that are also worth thinking about. So I do a lot of work on the video, I have done a lot of work on the video games context. And in that context, there may be additional parts that aren't just necessarily the the code, but also like audiovisual components, different different character designs, things like that, that may also have um, copyright attached. But copyright is one of the big things to think about in software curation. But I'll just mention there's a, a number of quick things to also uh, also flag as potential legal other legal regimes that may interact with particular pieces of software. Um, sometimes trademark, depending on the context. Um, so copyright protects artistic works, whereas trademark protects sort of um, brand names, uh, logos, that kind of thing, um, and it's meant to prevent consumer confusion. Um, and then DMCA 1201, uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, uh, which is uh, anti-circumvention right uh, within the United States, and we'll get into that uh, a little bit later. Um, and then obviously, uh, well, maybe not obviously, but contract, right? So if you're if you have a license for a particular software, you enter a contract with the software manufacturer. May, that may also change in some cases, the way in which your rights, uh, your rights interact with that piece of software. Um, but those are the sort of big regimes that we're often thinking about in this space and that lawyers would often sort of be like, hey, here's the things you, you might want to start thinking about. And all of these have sort of uh, fractal complexity, uh, like, you know, the further you get down, the more detailed uh, it is, including like sort of what they mean in very particular cases. So when we think about things like emulation versus making copies of software, that's actually a kind of different analysis for copyright purposes. And you're going to want to, it, often it's helpful to spend a teeny bit of time thinking about exactly what you want to do before you start sort of entering your copyright analysis. But I'm going to stop there and let Brandon pick up a little bit more on sort of how this stuff plays out in practice. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I, I share Kendra's um, feeling about this task, which is uh, I get paid to do it all the time, and yet I feel like it's impossible. Um, but, you know, the, the pricey version of copyright um, uh, is, is a challenge, and uh, Kendra's done a great job getting you started on that. And, and one thing that I wanted to be sure to note um, that Kendra sort of foreshadowed is um, it's a little weird that software is protected by copyright. Um, if you look at the Copyright Act, I mean, A, uh, you know, just saying out loud, copyright treats software like a literary work. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a self-refuting statement, or it's a statement that automatically raises an eyebrow. Um, copyright, in fact, uh, there's a provision in U.S. law, uh, Section 102, that tells you what kinds of things copyright is supposed to protect. And uh, it's not supposed to protect ideas and facts. Um, but it's also not supposed to protect systems and, you know, functional things. Like once you're, you're, you're trying to draw a line between um, expression and creativity on one hand and functionality and um, useful objects and items, and you want to say copyright is about the expressive stuff and not about the useful stuff um, in some broad way. And, of course, software is extremely useful. And in particular, when we're talking about 
the reasons where why libraries need software. Um, sort of, I often divide the universe in two. You know, sometimes you want to look at the software itself because you're interested in it and you want to study it. Um, but sometimes you just need it as a tool to render other files. And it's very strange that copyright law uh, binds us um, when we're dealing with software in that mode, when we're treating it as a tool. Um, you know, and, and this is especially an annoying because the meets and bounds of copyright are designed with expressive stuff in mind. And so it's very easy to get. Um, it, apl it applies automatically as soon as something is created. Uh, it's a very low bar, you know, any, basically any software is going to be copyrightable. The, the, the uncopyrightable software code probably does not exist. Um, and it lasts forever. I mean, it lasts for life of the creator plus 70 years or 95 years if it's a kind of corporate owner, um, which is forever in terms of the actual commercial utility of a software item. So it's a real mismatch there that we've sort of, we've made a kludge and, and you know, for the first couple of decades when software was protected by copyright, there were lots of compelling articles about why this is a bad idea and it shouldn't be the case. Um, but at this point, we've just accepted it, and now we have to live with it and figure out how to make it work. Um, but I think it is worth noting, just, just, you know, kicking against the wall at least one time to say, this stinks, you know, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Um, but here we are. Um, the other thing to mention, so uh, related to that, um, because the copyright protection that attaches to software is long and strong in the same way it is for a novel, um, uh, the public domain is an important concept to understand, but it is something that will not apply to most software for a generation from now, right? Most software has been created in the last 20 or 30 years and can look forward to, you know, 60 plus more years of protection. Um, Orphan works, on the other hand, is an extremely useful concept to understand. Um, Orphan works are works that have a copyright owner, but we don't know who that person is or we can't find them. Um, and that is an extremely common scenario in, in software. Uh, and orphan works, by the way, is a, is a kind of folk category. It doesn't exist in the law. There is no legal category of orphan works. There's no special treatment of orphan works under the law. Um, it's something that has just emerged as a fact about the world as a consequence of the law. And because soft, the software industry moves so quickly, um, and has such a short commercial lifespan, um, and the companies, especially in the early days, were so dynamic, they were coming apart, they were merging, they were falling apart, they didn't always have contracts. Orphan Works is a huge problem uh, in the software space. So those are some interesting additional kind of ground concepts in US copyright law. Um, and Andrew, thoughts on UK copyright law? And yeah. The legal I mean, domain. There are the, the, the biggest one of the biggest problems we face with dealing with copyright, and particularly copyright in an international environment, is that copyright regimes are national, in the sense of every uh, every country has its own copyright regime, which is harmonised a little bit by things like the Berne Convention. But there are often quite significant differences when you get down to, to the nuts and bolts of it. And there are very big differences between, for instance, um, uh, copyright in the US and copyright in the UK and indeed the, the other EU countries. Um, so I suppose that's the, that's the first lesson. Whenever you're dealing with a copyright in a particular work, sometimes you need to take into account the regimes of other countries apart from the country that you're necessarily operating in. Um, as Brandon says, I mean, copyright is very much a, a square peg in a, in a round hole. I think um, part of the reason why we protect software via copyright is simply that the regime existed and it was the easiest thing to fit software in rather than trying to come up with a whole new regime that we would then have to sell to every other country in the world. So it's much easier simply to say, well, we've got this regime copyright, of copyright. Software doesn't fit into it very well. But if we hammer it hard enough and we add enough exemptions, not only if we add the exemptions, can we make it fit, but we'll also keep the lawyers happy because they'll have lots of things to argue over for the next 20 years 
as to whether or not the exemptions apply in particular circumstances. So in the UK, there is, um, you know, software is covered by copyright, but there are specific rules within the Copyright Designs and Patents Act in the UK that cover computer programs. So things like rights to make backup copies, rights to decompile in limited circumstances, rights to observe, study, and test computer programs in certain circumstances, and so all of these kinds of things are specific to software, but you've got to know your way around the legislation in order to sort of follow these things up. So once you've, you've looked at the 350 pages of the Copyright Designs and Patents Act in the UK, you've then got to drill down to the very specific bit. So you need to be looking at section 50A, B, 50BA and 50C for software. You need to be looking at section 296Z um, because rather than producing a new copyright act every time we wanted to change copyright law in the UK, we've simply added to the existing copyright law, which was originally, this particular legislation was passed in 1998. So it's a bit of a mess. It's, it's, um, you have to carefully study um, the sections of it that apply to computer programs and then sort of build up from there how you can um, work with computer programs. We also have specific legislation on orphan works, courtesy of the European Union. Um, and as far as I can tell, it applies to certain works and not to others. And I can find no mention of software anywhere in the regime for orphan works. And we have a concept of orphan work, a work of, for which the copyright holder is unknown. We have a licensing scheme for orphan works where you can uh, apply to a particular body to grant you a license to use the work for which you pay a, a nominal license fee, which license fee is paid to the rights holder if they eventually emerge. Um, complicated area though. Um, I think the other thing that we find in terms of copyright in the UK is simply that a lot, a lot more people know about it than used to know about it uh, even 20 years ago. I mean, 20 years ago when I was doing, well, 30 years ago when I was doing my law degree, um, it was a niche subject. It was something you did if you wanted to go into sort of publishing law or if you were going to go into a very specialist law firm. Um, now people will talk about copyright down the pub, even, even if they're only talking about whether or not they can share music files and what the law is. And you, you spend quite a lot of time actually when you're talking to people in archives and uh, in libraries, correcting the things that they've learned down the pub. Because more often than not, the things that they've learned down the pub are wrong. <laughs> um, I think more, I'll, oh, sorry. I'm just gonna throw in two more sort of key, I think key concepts that we'll be talking about going forward. Um, and actually I'm gonna throw one of them over to Brandon, which is fair use, but I'm gonna talk for a second about what we mean when we say uh, DMCA 1201, which is a, a phrase that I've thrown out a couple times. So uh, this is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, uh, which is a statute passed in um, 1998 that uh, added some additional rights for copyright holders, um, mostly to deal with the uh, perception, with like the reality and perception of digital files being more easily shared than sort of more physical or analog medium. And what it does is it creates a separate set of rights for rights holders that, um, the, against uh, circumventing or sort of like getting around uh, technological protection mechanisms. Um, so what that means is sort of uh, like things like CD keys or like passwords for entry entry to like passwords you have to enter to a program or sort of like a license check that it reaches out a piece of software reaches out to a server for. Um, so before that stuff wasn't necessarily embedded within the copyright infringement regime. It might make prevent a, make it technically more difficult for someone to make a copy of software that was they shouldn't have been making a copy of. Um, but it was there was no sort of legal weight to those. But with the passage of DMCA 1201, there's now uh, a right that copyright holders can um, prevent people from circumventing those uh, those technical protection mechanisms, and also a set of rights called anti the anti trafficking part of the statute that prevents people in uh, from selling uh, tools or programs that allow other people to circumvent 
those, uh, those kinds of protection mechanisms. And why this is especially important in the context of software preservation is because um, courts actually have make, have sort of come out different ways on whether the underlying, you need to be committing copyright infringement to violate this right. Um, so if you're not committing copyright infringement, if what you're doing uh, in order to make a copy of the software um, is perfectly legal and like not something that's going to get you in trouble with rights holders, in some places you don't have anything to worry about from a DMCA 1201 perspective. Um, however, in others, you can still have violated DMCA 1201 by sort of uh, you know, circumventing a license check, even if what you're doing isn't a violation of copyright law. And this can be really tricky because this area of law is very, is quite complicated and often kind of technical. Um, but it's important to keep in mind because I think that this is something that generally speaking, even librarians who are super familiar with copyright, it's a particular set of, uh, it's a particular legal regime that comes into play more, much more often in software and is much more com complex and is sort of something to keep in mind. And we may talk a little bit later about what uh, the exemption process that SPN has been involved with and I've been involved with and Brandon was involved with to try to get some uh, flexibility in this space. But it's one more sort of thing to add to your like sort of mental checklist of stuff you're keeping an eye out for as you keep, um, keep going. And then I want to sort of throw it over to Brandon to just give us a little bit on fair use, which I think will be really important as we keep going. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. That's it's very it's 12, 1201 is extremely important in this context. And we'll definitely be talking more about that. And, um, you know, one way to talk about fair use is to um, call back to what Andrew was just saying about the specific exemptions, right? So in the UK system, and in the US system, there are these very carefully drafted bargains that were made uh, in the legislative process where people uh, interested in copyright law got together and said, okay, legislators, you know, I'm, a, I'm a, an arcade operator. There's an exemption in the U.S. law that says if you have a coin-operated video game that you own uh, on your premises, you know, people can, it's not a public performance that, that triggers copyright for you to let people play that video game, right? There are a series of these kinds of exemptions that are specific. There's another one, section 117 in US law, that says, you know, if you own a piece of software, it's not a copyright infringement if somebody has to boot it up in order to fix your computer, right? Which sounds like an insane thing to prosecute, but of course, somebody tried. Uh, and so we have a specific exemption. And we have another one that says, Again, if you own a, a piece of software, you can make one copy and sort of put it in your drawer as long as you never use it. Uh, and you can transfer that one copy to someone who buys the main copy as long as you have no copies at the end of the transaction, right? And again, it's just extremely narrow. Um, Section 108 for libraries uh, is a specific exemption that gets you a little further than those other two. You can make, you know, three copies and, and sort of keep them in, but, but what can you do with those copies? Uh, it's very specifically spelled out in section 108. Not, not a useless provision, an important provision, but uh, I, I would argue that in the software context, all of these little narrow exemptions really leave us wanting. And so in the US context, uh, there is an additional provision that's a kind of open-ended provision. It doesn't say what it applies to, Exactly, and it doesn't say what behavior it covers or, or, or exempts from copyright. Instead, um, the fair use provision says uh, that on a case-by-case -case basis, judges can uh, protect new uses of copyrighted works if those uses are fair. And then it describes a decision process that judges have to go through in order to find that a use is fair. And it gives some examples of what kinds of uses are fair, Com commentary, criticism, scholarship, and so on. Um, the great thing about fair use is that it is open-ended. And so um, for situations like, I would argue, like the one where we find ourselves, where a lot of the specific exemptions just don't go far enough, the market is broken and isn't helping us, the licenses we think we would want if we could get them aren't on offer. Fair use is a kind of saves the day provision that will ride in. If you are careful with what you do and you're conscientious and you work to develop the, the strategy that you, that, that you deploy, fair use can help here. But the main thing to know about fair use is it's flexible, it's open-ended, and it leaves you with a lot of discretion and responsibility then to apply it and to think carefully about what to do with it. Uh, thank you. Um, 
uh, so just here. Can, can, I, can I just step in quickly there? I mean, the, of one of the things we need to, <laughs> to mention um, is that under UK law, there is no such thing as fair use. <laughs> Um, we have a similar but different, wouldn't you believe, a, um, approach called fair dealing. And it, this is a very much more precisely targeted approach. Um, you can fair deal um, in, in copyright works for certain certain personal copies for private use, research and private study, um, Copying text and data for non-commercial research, and the non-commercial is, is very important there. Um, making of temporary copies, making of temporary copies, the making temporary making of a copy of a computer program in your computer's RAM. When you fire up Word, you're creating a copy in the random access memory of your computer. Theoretically, that's a breach of copyright, which is why we have a specific um, permission to do that under um, fair dealing. And we, it's very important to distinguish between fair dealing and fair use and to make sure you understand which one applies to your particular circumstance in the sense of are you operating under US law or are you operating under UK law because the ramifications of that for your particular use may be very, very different. Um, I, I agree. Jess here from Canada, where we also have a uh, fair dealing. Um, while we're speaking about permissions, we have uh, one question that's come up a lot in our community, and that is we want to know what your thoughts are on securing permissions directly from uh, software publishers or creators. Um, uh, Andrew, do you want to start? I've suggested in the past, certainly um, at Digital Preservation, right, Digital Preservation Coalition meetings, I think, that I sometimes think that um, software publishers simply don't un necessarily understand or think about the long term when they're thinking of their 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 programs, and that it's in terms of archiving, in terms of potential reuse. I think as long as you are not competing directly with a software publisher's existing product, there is some scope to negotiate um, over archiving. There's some scope to negotiate directly with publishers, uh, in some ways almost offering a service, saying, that, hey, we know you don't necessarily want to keep all of this um, uh, older software uh, going you may not want to keep it around you may not want to you know escrow it or anything we'll do that for you we will actually be doing that the quid pro quo is that perhaps you have to be a little bit more open with it than you would be under existing copyright law um, as was said though I mean the, the problem with a lot of software is if you are archiving or storing software with the intent that people can come in and use that, you may run into problems where um, the publisher perceives that as damaging their contemporary use of software or, or damaging the market. So if, for instance, we were to archive, um, I don't know, Word 2003, Microsoft might have a problem with us saying to people, come in and look at uh, this and work with this and, and tease it apart and so on, because they might say, well, this risks our market, market in Microsoft 2000 and whatever we are now, uh, Microsoft Word 2017, let's say. Um, so it's, I, I've sort of talked about this with people, but I have to say we've never really got terribly far with that. Uh, Kendra, do you have any experience with that? Um, sure. So I'm actually going to draw a little bit upon a bunch of the research we did for uh, both rounds of uh, 1201 exemptions, where often uh, we had to talk about whether why getting permission was not like a workable option. Um, and so the reality is that a software publishers they like like as Andrew said may not really understand why this is important or why it matters. B uh, 
for some sets of forms of software, especially where they where the intellectual property has been bought and sold and gone through like multiple organizations or multiple companies, it's actually higher. It can be lawyers and companies can perceive it as higher risk to authorize or give a license to someone to do this kind of work than to just leave it alone. If they're not entirely sure who owns what intellectual property or like what the extent copyright status is, they might not actually think that they have the rights to tell an organization or a software preservation institution that they can do anything. Um, which is something that actually happens a lot. Like some Henry Lowe did some fantastic work, which y'all are probably more familiar with than I am even. Um, at Stanford, and they sent out hundreds of permissions letters to try to get access to uh, the software collection and had a very, very like a low response rate and a much lower sort of acceptance rate. Um, and what Andrew said about sort of the perception that old software competes with existing software um, is especially true for uh, certain categories of video game publishers. Um, like the Entertainment Software Association in the United States has uh, heavily <laughs> Uh, uh, been really resistant to efforts by software preservationists to make video games available for preservation, but also for like sort of continued play in a museum setting. Um, and actually, I think, I believe in the most recent 1201 exemption process, I went on the record saying that video game companies were doing all of this video game software preservation that needed to be done, which is a really uh, striking statement that I think is uh, not necessarily what I would say about what's going on. Um, so, I think generally speaking, permissions can be really useful in some particular cases, especially if it's sort of an individual author. If it was like, you know, research software that was published by a single person who sort of like abandoned it, then that might be a case where actually this is like a really easy option. But when you're thinking about like large companies um, or sort of IP that's changed, intellectual property that's changed hands multiple times, uh, you know, it can really not necessarily, it has a much lower sort of, uh, uh, uptake rate, like our uptake rate, than one would really hope for. Uh, Brandon, I see you nodding, nodding along there. <laughs> Do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, yeah. I, well, so the um, project that I'm working on on a code of best practices and fair use issued a report uh, as a result of our first phase of work, which was focused on interviewing folks who are currently engaged in software preservation to find out, you know, when do they hit barriers. And um, we titled that report uh, uh, something about the, you know, and I forget the exact title, but it's sort of the permissions culture in software preservation, uh, because everyone we spoke with assumed that they needed permission. And the most frustrating thing about copyright for them was that they couldn't get it. That is, uh, as Kendra said, you know, people with like a fair amount of resources and expertise like Henry Lowood um, really, really tried quite hard, you know, really put in some diligence and could not get people, even when they would find someone, as Kendra said, that person would say, you know, I know my name's on the box, right? But I don't remember who wrote this program or what my agreement with them looked like. And I don't want that person to pop up and sue me because I gave you permission, and so I don't think I can help you today. So it, getting permission was really, has been traditionally a very vexed and, and kind of difficult thing, which is true sort of at, at in general, it's become, I think, a, a very useful truism among librarians that seeking permission doesn't scale. Um, you know, the, in all kinds of contexts, archival contexts, librarians have shown through their diligence over and over again that the cost of finding and securing permissions uh, from the right person is insanely high at any kind of scale. If, so if you're not talking about, you know, as Kendra said, if you've got the person in your office saying, here's a box of software I wrote, my goodness, of course, yes, get that person to sign a permissions uh, grant. But by and large, if you've got a box of software uh, from, you know, someone who was an enthusiast in the 70s and they say, this is all the stuff I bought in the Bay Area, you know, God only knows. Processing that box by asking permission is a non-starter. It will never get done. Um, and so uh, that's one aspect of permission I think that it's important to, to, to understand. The other thing that's interesting is to think strategically about the question of permission. Um, you know, Kendra alluded to this, um, that you know, the companies, some of them feel like we're already doing everything that needs to be done and you people don't need to do it. 
um, a lot of them feel like uh, it's, it's not even worth taking our phone calls because whatever it is we want to do isn't going to make them any money, right? We're not their market. Um, a lot of times you call, you call your contact at Microsoft or wherever, and that person says, I don't know, I'm going to have to talk to legal, and then you never hear back, right? They're just not set up to grant us permission because the things we want to do aren't their market. Um, which foreshadows the strength of our fair use argument, right? They don't need us. They don't want us. They don't want our money. They don't even know how to take our money um, in this context. And the last thing I'll say is, in terms of thinking strategically, is I think we have to, we have to get uh, all of our fair use ducks in a row and all of the things that we can do without asking them. We need to be confident about what those things are, uh, I think, strategically, before we go asking. Uh, before we go and create a market that may actually be a market in things that we can do without having to pay, right? Um, it's a well-documented phenomenon in the legal literature that the scope of fair use can expand and contract based on what people are willing to pay for, and that the more sort of, the more inclined you are um, to, to create a market for something, your fair use rights will shrink accordingly. A court will say, well, gosh, all these other people are paying for that. That can't be a fair use. And so we have to think really carefully about the kinds of things which we even pursue a license for and, and avoid pursuing licenses for things that we could do on our own merits uh, using the rights that we have under the law. Well, thank you all. I mean, that was, um, I wish we could continue this for a longer period of time. We will have a part two. There was so much amazing information from Andrew, Kendra, and Brandon to unpack and to think about. Um, so again, thank you, Kendra, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Brandon. Um, we're gonna go ahead and take some time now for questions from our participants on today's webinar. And just as a reminder for everyone on the call, please be sure to type your questions into the question box in, your, in, the, in the control panel for Zoom. I think that's the best way to ensure that Jess and Paula and I um, can see it and we'll make sure to field it to our, our special guest. And we do have a, a kickoff question from our participants today. Um, William Kilbride from the Digital Preservation Coalition has a question. Um, how do you know which jurisdiction you're working in? So does cloud or distributed computing imply multiple jurisdictions at once? Great question, William. <laughs> okay. you so None of us want to so, unmute our mics. <laughs> that's right, exactly. But it's just so easy. I don't. I don't want to waste too much time. <laughs> um, uh, no, it's a nightmare question. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it should be easy. There actually is sort of a rule. A rule in the international copyright system that copyright is territorial. Uh, that means the law that applies to you is the law where you are. You know, if you're standing, if you're standing in France, um, you know, um, you should be subject to the laws of France. Um, there is no international copyright law, as Andrew said. There's just a, a patchwork of national laws. Um, but what that question gets vexed, obviously, because of the internet. And so we've seen um, several cases, uh, not only in the copyright context, but in all kinds of contexts where. Uh, someone in, you know, country B sues someone in country A, uh, and the courts in country B say, you know, sorry, buddy, but you, you got online and you came into our country using the internet, right? And so there's a sense that, you know, you targeted, you know, like, sometimes these cases, oftentimes, I think, and I haven't, I haven't read them all, of course, but the thing that, I, that sticks out to me is that oftentimes, that gives me a little bit of comfort, is that often these cases involve so-called targeting of the foreign jurisdiction. So I'm posting in German, you know, and I'm posting things that are of interest to Germans, and I'm saying, hey, Germans, you know, uh, enjoy this content. Uh, the U.S., you know, the U.S.-based um, muse online museum of German video games for Germans, by Germans, hosted in the U.S., at that point, that kind of stuff is what gets you really, um, uh, potentially could get you dragged into a foreign jurisdiction. But there are no, uh, I, I don't know of any clear, crystal clear doctrinal lines that tell you when you're safe and when you're not, um, other than the kinds of things I just described. There have certainly been 
cases not in not relating to archiving or preservation where a software company has sued another software company for copying allegedly and they've lost in one jurisdiction and then sued in another the um, SAS software was was brought in the UK I think initially and the um, complainant there lost in the UK and I think successfully sued in the US I believe that's the case I don't know if Kendra or Brandon are aware of that one um, so I, I suppose it, dep it depends on your as you say it depends where you are at any given point so yes the the sort of the national rule would tend to apply but if you have international reach or you are operating internationally so let's say you're, you're a um, an organization wanting to do preservation but you have um, a branch in the UK and a branch in the US then you can be sued in both uh, and the um, the complainant's going to pick the jurisdiction usually that's most favorable. Perfect. Um, thank you all for, for that response <laughs> to, to William's excellent and also a provocative question. Much appreciated. I think there's there are a few things that I've already tagged as, as potential areas for a more nuanced follow-up with our special guests. And some of that might be offline and some of that might be covered um, in, in next week's episode. So just to, to go to Melissa's question, uh, which was after Williams, so if, if the general idea is not to worry too much, although, you know, with caveats, not to worry too much about permissions for the preservation of software, how do each of you think about calibrating levels of access, reuse access to software? Um, this is a great question and having made Brandon and Andrew answer the last one, I'll take a first crack at it. Um, so I think that the way I would think about this, and I think we sort of uh, use this word internally, but we haven't necessarily talked about it too much sort of facing y'all yet, is, you know, when you're thinking about per doing things without permission, you're always on some level thinking about risk, right? Like, what is the risk that I'll get sued? What is the risk to my institution? What am I, you know, how important is this sort of, is this sort of work like and often frankly the risk in a lot of these cases is actually going to be quite low um, but when you're thinking about sort of how you structure access in in reference to something where you haven't asked permission what you might do is say okay you know i'm going to take a look at if i'm in the us my four my four fair use factors and my fair use cases and i'm going to think about how people might want to use this work so if someone's doing for example uh like critical code studies on uh, parts of uh, Word 2003. Um, my fair use assessment is probably going to be that that's the kinds of things that generally fair use covers really well. And so I'm going to be frankly less concerned about uh, that kind of access to a work, right? But there are other kinds of access, for example, if you're Avail making something available to the full public rather than to scholars that might be one sort of lever or you switch you switch you switch um, certain kinds of uh, so certain works are more core to the protection of copyright than others so for example works audiovisual works are like Harry Potter it generally speaking uh, we can think of as getting more copyright protection or being closer to the heart of copyright than the word 2003. So when you think about access, that's a really good time to do spend some time with the fair use factors and the fair use case law and a friendly lawyer who uh, likes you and wants you to succeed. Um, or a friendly person who knows the law pretty well also works. Um, and think about, okay, how, what are the different ways in which I could structure this access that help me make a really good case for fair use? Um, one thing we so, I'm sometimes think about, and I'm, you know, I'm not sure how well this transfers to other contexts, is uh, thinking about different, um, you know, asking uh, users to certify that they're using things for particular uses can be useful, um, you know, as a sort of optics thing if you're making use of works. But those are some ways I think about it. Um, but I do think that that can be one set of options you pursue if you want to lower your risk while still sort of not going out and asking for permission. And then Brandon, thank you for that, Kendra. And then Brandon and Andrew, I would ask if y'all have sort of uh, a brief response to that, and then we will, I just want to articulate the remaining questions that we may have to um, address offline from Melissa and Eliza, and then we'll wrap up the episode. 
I actually don't have much to add to Kendra's really great uh, response to Melissa's first question. So maybe we should go to Melissa's much harder uh, second question. <laughs> Um, isn't fair use awesome? Uh, what about all the countries that don't have it? Um, and uh, Andrew and I got to talk about this a little bit in, prepar in preparing for this um, presentation. Uh, and you know, there are a few ways to think about uh, the the fact that, to my mind, fair use is going to be really important in the U.S. context uh, because of the narrowness of all those specific exceptions. Uh, um, so, what does that mean for the rest of the world? Um, and you know, there are a few things that that can mean. Uh, of course, if you're in the rest of the world and you don't have fair use, then the things that we do relying on fair use, you can't do yet. Uh, you have to think about other strategies and other theories. Um, but uh, copyright legislation is happening around the world and copyright policy is changing. And so um, we see in Australia, we see in Europe already, uh, we see in, in um, South Africa, uh, lots of countries are considering what, you know, what we call fair use. They, they can't call it fair use because it would sound too much American-like, so often it's called open norms. Um, but a, an open-ended exception like fair use is on the table, and people are actively arguing about why it's a good thing. And I think if we had a really robust, you know, and the arguments are, you know, look at America's X, Y, Z, um, you know, they are doing this and we can't do it. Isn't that frustrating and obnoxious? That's a very, you know, in, in Australia, the educational community there is extremely frustrated about the lack of fair use. And they've done very well by saying, you know, American students don't have to pay for this crap. Why do we? Um, and I think if we had a really robust, really compelling software preservation activity happening nationwide in the U.S. underwritten by fair use, that could help our friends abroad explain, you know, look, we'd love to do this, but right now we're not sure we can. And now the Americans are getting ahead of us in the race to save uh, digital culture, which is, which is of course, uh, very important, like the race to the moon and the race to nuclear weapons. Andrew, any follow-up to that before we wrap up? Um, as, I, as, I say, I mean, as I said before, the, the, the systems are, to the US and the UK systems are quite different. And yes, at the moment, I think we are behind in terms of the kind of fair use approach that we see in the United States compared to fair dealing. Fair dealing in the UK is very, very rigid. It's patrolled very, very narrowly by the courts. On the other hand, when we actually look at what you can do with software, what the courts in the EU and UK have said about what is copyrightable in and of itself. They've taken a much narrower approach to what parts of computer programs are copyrightable and what kinds of things are, are simply not protected by copyright. So there's some wiggle room there as well. So there are two, possibly two things to be looking at there. One is the the extent to which we ought to be pursuing a more fair use type orientation with regard to things that we can do. But we might also want perhaps the US to be looking at a situation where they're a little bit less prescriptive about or a little bit more freer about things that should be copyright in the first place. Um, and I, I, I think certainly in, in the... UK, we have seen computer software companies actually being a little upset by the limitations of copyright on what they can claim as theirs. Um, and, and so that, that is, I think, very much narrower now than it is in the United States. So some balance between those things. Um, we can play those two things depending on which jurisdiction we're in. So while we can be saying to our legislators, look at what the Americans are doing, look how easy they're making it to advance um, their education, their, their technology. You can be, guys can be saying in the States, well, you know, look, at, look how narrowly copyright is applied to software. Um, look at, look at um, the advantages that not locking, you know, things that should perhaps be considered to be simply um, structural things, things that are, aren't innovative or what we might traditionally consider to be copyright.
Um, if we take a more narrow approach to copyright, that might be an advantage to us against the Europeans. Um, I also just want to tackle Eliza's question real fast because I can do this one in like 15 seconds. Uh, uh, does fair use only work for nonprofits or academic institutions? No. Uh, or can a company who wants to use their software in the same way for their own internal reference be covered by fair use too? Yes. Um, uh, and so when we think about fair use in the United States, we often think about nonprofit character, which doesn't necessarily always refer to whether the institution is for profit or nonprofit. Um, so definitely the fact that an institution it makes money does not prohibit it from making a fair use claim. And, and again, just to jump in there, in with regard to fair dealing, it does matter. <laughs> and the, the legislation usually specifically states whether or not you can use fair dealing rights for commercial or non-commercial use, and it's usually non-commercial. Perfect. Oh. And I'll add one last postscript, which is uh, it, it always matters how you characterize what you do. So Eliza is, is a very smart person. So of course she's characterized what she does in a legally smart way, which is the exact same thing. Um, you have to watch out though, because your opponents could recharacterize your use in a different way. So in, in a commercial context, it, it, it becomes, you know, sort of marginally more important to characterize your use carefully because you're, you're you're vulnerable to being characterized as you know merely commercially exploiting in a way that a, a researcher at a university might be harder to pin that down on perfect that was brilliant thank you all so much we actually addressed all of our questions <laughs> so again huge thanks to andrew to kendra and to brandon for spending this time with us today truly truly a pleasure um, to be with you all and uh, huge thanks to all of our participants that were able to join us today uh, and participate, ask questions and engage. So with that, I just want to remind everyone that we'll be back here same time next week. Um, uh, unfortunately, Kendra won't be with us, but hopefully we can rope her into more events in the future. And um, we'll be joined by Andrew and Brandon again and also Burkhart Schaefer. Um, and picking up where Brandon left off earlier, we'll, we'll sort of the logical flow from episode six, we'll be looking at, you know, at other tacks besides some of the things discussed today to enable and support lawful preservation, sharing, and reuse. So again, you'll hear from us as a follow-up, and thank you all. Have a wonderful day.